Okay, uh, assalamualaikum and uh, good afternoon everyone. So, uh, I'll be, no, uh, so today was uh, essentially trying to replace somebody else's turn. So I'm just going to uh, do a rerun of my talk at uh, a recent conference in Turkey. So uh, again, uh, this is a, 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 a rehash of an earlier talk. Uh, but no, essentially, no, uh, I just update this uh, with a few new things. Okay, uh, let me just go through. Uh, I can do this with my tab. Right, uh, so it's on quantization, and some of you probably have seen this you know, in some form or another. You know, I've been giving this kind of talk quite a uh, few times. So, uh, what's the motivation of this? Uh, uh, essentially, is to, to find. Uh, what new things around quantization, and then uh, some reassessment. Uh, so also maybe include some insights, from, new insights from uh, quantum information. I'm not sure whether you can see this cursor. Did you see the cursor somewhere? Anyone seeing the cursor? Okay, great. So I can also use the tab. Hopefully it's not working at the moment. Let me just redo this. Okay. Uh, right. Get rid of that. Okay. So uh, the idea was to no. Uh, I was a bit ambitious when I first gave this. Uh, title to the organizers so I was thinking of doing all this you know, uh, together with some insights from uh, quantum foundations and quantum information which you probably see that it's really missing from the talk but you know, let me just indicate where it's supposed to be and then uh, one should also be aware of the fact that we are using quantum technologies basing on the picture that we already have on the conventional uh, Hilbert space formalism usually you know, and how should one really think about it and one should also be very careful about you know, what's being assumed because you, you're relying your technology on a, a, a particular a formulation of uh, quantum theory so one has to be aware what's the assumptions taken into the, the, the theory that, that's being adopted for technologies. Of course, the other thing that, that, uh, that sort of uh, crop up uh, <laughs> during uh, Fauzi's uh, work okay, uh, was to think about uh, non non competitive quantum mechanics and uh, also the you know, the things that I've discussed with uh, uh, Dr. Said Hasibu Hassan is how to actually uh, get to the point of using non competitive uh, differential geometry. Of course, I'm not going to go into most of these things. So the, the talk at the uh, Istanbul conference uh, essentially just give an overview of what's going on okay so the main uh, as as you probably have seen the main article that I refer to is essentially from Prof Tarek okay. Tarek in English okay. so this is still the main uh, thing that uh, one needs to you know, look into uh, uh, things related to quantum information things like positive operator valued measures and things like that. You can read this from uh, this long article by uh, Hanosari and Zeman, which is uh, published in uh, 
uh, at the physical slavic like, uh, thing yes no more than 100 pages kind of thing okay so and of course uh, non commutative differential geometry of course you have the the, the book by cons himself which of course now is typically it's difficult to read you need to read other things uh, in order to understand this book okay so uh let me just go through so i think most of you know what quantization is so you just look from uh no you just convert your classical observables to quantum observables and what are classical observables there are just functions on phase space Okay, so they are not operators, they are just functions. So meaning uh, to get values from these functions, you just need, you know, uh, you need to tell what, what points you are looking at inside your phase space. Okay. Uh, for quantum observables, however, you no, know, there are operators. So the operators will have to act on some states which are given uh, on the Hilbert space. Okay. So this was the, this is essentially the, the conventional idea of quantization. So you go from functions to operators. Okay. And uh, in the beginning, there are you know, various rules that people do. I think Dirac was the, the instrumental uh, person who actually uh, saw the relationship between Poisson bracket and commutator okay so in in a way the traditional uh, quantization is based on algebras so this is a this both are actually Lie algebras okay. and uh, the Lie, algeb Lie algebraic aspects is separate from from the the the, the observables the observables themselves form an algebra. Okay, so, so in other words, the Lie algebraic aspects come uh, later, okay, and uh, which is given by these uh, commutators that people talk about. This is actually uh, first introduced in this paper in 1925. Okay. So uh, the assumption is really that okay, there is a correspondence between the Poisson bracket. But how you actually do the mapping was not really specified, okay? But there are rules. There are rules that uh, they think they uh, they should obey. One of the first rules is essentially linearity. So you can do uh, uh, linear combinations of your observables, and that will uh, amount to linear combinations of your operators, okay? And then if you take a function of your observable, so this is a function phi onto the observable f, so that would also correspond to a function on the operators that represent f itself. Okay, and this is called von Neumann rule. And then the Lie algebra correspondence that I mentioned earlier. And then you need uh, uh, the identity, uh, well, the constant observable becomes the identity inside your Hilbert space. And finally, uh, one needs to reproduce quantum mechanics. Okay, so in other words, this has to be obeyed at some level. Okay, so essentially, this is also the problem that. Uh, one gets uh, when you do quantization because you need to obey this at some point. Okay. So this is uh, the rules, and uh, there are problems with this rules. This was actually discussed by uh, Tariq and uh, English okay, uh, in their review paper. In fact, uh, the 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 conclusion that one gets from there was, in fact, any of this, uh, you can even get uh, uh, any three of these uh, rules and you you find that there will be a, an obstruction. So you cannot implement all these rules. Okay? So 
So this was the difficulty. So essentially, what the, the probably the one that sort of you know, people realize that it's not going to work is uh, the one given by uh, it's called the Gromwell Van Hoof theorem. Okay, but let's see what's happening uh, in this particular case. So I uh, one should ask the question whether one can actually quantize all observables, all observables in principle. So in other words, you can recall that your Von Neumann rule. You say that okay, any function of your say your basic observables are usually being given as your Q and P. Okay, so any observables. Uh, will, uh, in, in the classical sense, would be just these functions, okay? And uh, when you quantize those, uh, uh, in principle, you think that you can actually get some form of operator that corresponds to these functions, uh, which is true for all functions, okay? So that was the dream that they had earlier. But people realized this very much later that you cannot actually do that. In fact, in some sense, uh, it should be obvious to algebraize, okay, because your Poisson bracket algebra is an infinite dimensional algebra. Okay, and your commutator algebra, usually uh, based on a particular group, are essentially finite dimensional. So there already you should have, you no, know, once you have realized that, uh, that you cannot really contest all observables. But okay, let's see how it feels. So at the quadratic level, you talk about no, uh, your, uh, your, your variables here uh, being multiplied to each other at uh, second order. So you can have x squared, for example, and p squared. So these are corresponding to the multiplication operator here, and then a differentiation operator. Here, here I'm assuming that you can apply your Schrodinger representation. Okay, so you need to have this, okay, together with this uh, quadratic uh, functions, okay, but uh, with this, it's not so much of a problem when it is done separately. The one that's giving you a problem is when you mix variables, okay. So in this case, your xp, uh, you probably need something like this in order for it to work, okay. So this is not not really obvious, but you can actually uh, do it using this operator, okay? And if you try to sort of do, uh, so these are at the observable, observable level, okay? So once you can actually do this, okay, one needs to, uh, what you call, one needs to, uh, extend this or no, uh, include this the algebraic aspect. So in this case, uh, you have to check all possible uh, what you call the uh, all possible uh, commutators, for example, or in this case, Poisson bracket for the classical case, between uh, X, P, identity and then x squared p squared and then x and p okay so you check with this uh, so-called observables see whether this uh, Lie algebraic correspondent uh, would actually uh, work and for this particular case it's okay at a quadratic level okay so uh, at a ternary level, that means you go to cubic uh, in terms of the variables, then you can have, again, a similar kind of thing, uh, assuming your Schrodinger represent again. I hope the automatic uh, admission is working. Okay, uh, right. So let me get back. So again, at the observable level, it's going to be something like this. This observable level. 
you implement this so far so good okay uh, the only problem is when you go to the uh, the, art, the algebraic the Lie algebraic level you can see for example this correspondence between this Poisson bracket with this Poisson bracket not to say correspondence I should say the equality of this Poisson bracket with this okay together with this uh, uh, constant multiplying them it's going to give you the same answer as x squared p squared okay and uh, you try to bring it over to the quantum case so you do the same uh, co the correspondence between this Poisson bracket with that and then this Poisson bracket with that okay and try to find out what it is and hopefully it correspond to this operator corresponding operator for that but the answer that you get over here is almost the same apart from this constants that, that you get from from uh, 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 from using this uh, what you call commutator rule okay so in other words it doesn't give you the same operator as x squared p squared no the expectation that you get only a, a, a single operator uh, corresponding to this which you don't don't really get so in other words uh, there's a problem here. okay so uh, this is actually known very much later if you remember the the direct was proposing the rules uh, in 1925 here and the first uh, observ uh, observation that says it's, there's something wrong with it was much later in 1946 and uh, later was uh, I couldn't read this uh, uh, reference though uh, I hope they will translate this at some point uh, and then there's a, a slightly more general result by Van Hove okay so together they are uh, the, 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 the results given by Gromwell and Van Hovark uh, uh, mentioned as a theorem by later uh, by other mathematical physicists. So you can actually read uh, this paper by Gauthier and Handling, Grandling and Tynman. Grandling is essentially my senior in Adelaide. And this is actually published in 1996, showing this in, in, in detail, the explicit details of how it actually have, has a problem uh, in general. Okay. Actually, Gauthier has a different uh, paper here, here for R to N specifically. Okay. But uh, the one here is actually a review article. We have done some other uh, cases like your uh, S1, S2 case. Okay. These are nonlinear spaces. Oops, nonlinear spaces. And the obstruction are even worse. If you look at the case of R to N, uh, the obstruction is at the ternary level. Okay, where the, the algebraic correspondent fails. Whereas for S1 and S2, okay, actually they, what they did was T star S1. Okay. Uh, the correspondence, uh, the obstruction is already found at quadratic level. Okay. So in other words, uh, you are not allowed to just quantize all observables. Okay. So that's where we come to the point of having the first, what I call the first crossroad, according to my view, okay, uh, uh, where uh, you need to resolve this problem of uh, Gromwell Van Hove uh, uh, theorem or abstraction. Okay, 
So how do you resolve this is to say that, okay, remember our problem is always the Lie algebraic correspondence. Okay, so we say, we still take that to be true and then only quantize selected observables. So you don't quantize all observables. Now, uh, okay, let me go through the, the other one first. Okay, the other resolution is supposed to say that, okay, your Lie algebraic correspondence is only approximately true. And somehow under this approximation, all, okay, I put this in inverted commas, observables can be quantized. Okay, uh, the only thing is not really true. <laughs> so uh, I will explain later and give you show you a, 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 a Wikipedia page about that, okay? So, uh, now, uh, usually the, the, the first route to this uh, resolution is uh, given by uh, schools under, say, I should include canonical quantization itself. Doesn't look like canonical there. Uh, Canonical quantization, which is uh, no, you you know that canonical quantization works. You no, know, meaning you you assume this, okay. But uh, this only works for the case of uh, for the case of uh, linear spaces, meaning R to n, okay. Uh, in order to address canonical quantization uh, to other spaces than R to N, then what you do is you do canonical quantization by constraints, which uh, my undergrad student will be looking at it. Okay, uh, Joshua, are you there? Okay, so that is really under canonical quantization, okay, where you have constraints onto your uh, what you call coordinates and your momenta, okay. Uh, of course, there there are more sophisticated version of this uh, using geometric quantization, and uh, the other crossroad that I will mention later on is the canonical group quantization, and both of these uh, quantization techniques use uh, symplectic geometry and also the construction of Hilbert spaces. Okay, now this is where uh, I did mention about you no know, having uh, either you have a quantization based on Hilbert space or non-Hilbert space. Now you you might be surprised why I'm saying that because really when you go to the other option which uses uh, normally is under the general idea of deformation quantization, it doesn't really require Hilbert spaces. Okay? Deformation quantization simply extends your phase space. Okay? You extend your phase space or your Poisson manifold. So these are actually uh, uh, classical things. The only thing that becomes non-classical is that you have a deformed product structure. Okay, so the classical case, you know, F G equals to G F, that's not that's not going to work because you have an, another uh, product structure that actually okay, this will not be commutative anymore. Yeah. Can I ask something? Uh, is is there exhibit any transformation from one type of quantization to others? Yes, there is. Uh, uh, let, let me finish this first. Okay, I, I, I'll show you the, the, the way to do it. Well, I, I, not me. I'll show you the Wikipedia uh, okay. uh, that does that. Okay. Right. Uh, so let me just, uh, this is the thing because I, I don't have it. Uh, the conference talk was just only 40 minutes and I, I know that I'm not going to do much. So I just had one slide to talk about deformation quantization. So the idea is that you deform 
your product structure between functions okay by introducing some kind of uh, a power series and uh, this power series uh, will come with some uh, operators over here uh, so essentially a bi differential operators because it acts on two different functions okay so uh, with this you can actually define the Lie algebraic correspondence approximately okay, by taking this star product thing uh, and then take the difference between the two orderings and then essentially uh, this should correspond to your Poisson bracket plus high order terms. So do take note at this stage it's all on the Phi space. No Hilbert space are involved. Okay. So the uh, the most popular one that seems to work uh, well is the Bond Jordan operator ordering. So uh, where's the operator ordering comes in is in this bilinear, so not bilinear, bi differential operator actually determine your operator ordering okay so you can insert different uh, operator orderings uh, to here and then you get a different kind of quantization okay so the one that's popular the bond jordan operator ordering leads to what is known as the moyle bracket so the your moyle bracket sort of uh, correspond to the commutator in, in in this sense okay so this gives you a moyle bracket okay. so okay let me just uh leave this for a while and then let me go to the website of here's an example This is just a Wikipedia page on, oops, what happens? This is a Wikipedia page. Somehow it doesn't like what I'm doing. Uh, that talk about Wigner Wild Transform. Okay, so essentially uh, this is part of the, the Moyo bracket thing. Uh, let me just go down here. So the idea here you introduce for any particular functions here. Okay. Uh, you can introduce uh, so-called operators uh, capital Q and capital P. Okay. Uh, and that will do the work. So your capital P and capital Q will be some operators which you can now define it as uh, acting on some Hilbert space. So in other words, you, you have this transition from phase space to a Hilbert space uh, formalism. Okay. Uh, I will not go through this because no, the, the, one of the things that I dislike uh, is the formation quantization, quantization thing is essentially they involve a lot of this expansion of exponentials okay which you, know, you can get uh just like uh you try to prove baker campbell hausdorff formula okay that kind of uh you no know, uh messiness that you can get from this kind of thing okay so uh the idea is now with that kind of so you can you can go from this kind of functions to uh those that involve these operators Okay, so you can get all these different operator ordering uh, depending on what kind of, of, of quantization procedure that you actually uh, take. Okay. And here is where the, the, the Lie algebraic correspondence is supposed to be. So, and you can see that even in this particular case, they limit themselves to a polynomial degree of at most two, but the other polynomial can be arbitrary. Okay, and then your Lie algebraic correspondence 
uh, can be uh, shown to hold. Okay. But let me get you no know, before you say okay, this is much better than say uh, canonical quantization. Let me just go to this point. And normally, uh, deformation quantization school would not try. Well, no, they would not say this too much. But essentially, you can see here. Despite its name, uh, you see the the. Yeah, highlight this. Can I highlight this? No, I can't. Let me see if I can drag this. Uh, no, it doesn't seem to work as well. Oh, yes. Okay, well, okay never mind. Uh, the last sentence here, okay? Uh, it says what? Deformation quantization does not constitute a successful quantization scheme. Okay, namely, a method to produce quantum theory, our classical one, uh, and then uh, you have these operators now acting on Hilbert space, uh, what you call related to the, the phase space formulation uh, of deformation uh, quantization thing. Okay, so in other words, no, despite that, what people actually say, uh, no, there is problems. Uh, no. That's why I was a bit curious in the beginning. How do they actually resolve it? Uh, well, they, as you can see, they do not resolve everything. The best that they can do is probably just take one of the observable to be of degree two, and the other one is going to be a bit. That's the best thing that they can actually do, at least for this uh, particular case. Of course, uh, for other quantization, you might need to see uh, what's being adopted and what, what's been assumed. And you can, again, enlarge this a little bit more, but it, usually you won't be you know, getting all the observables to be quantized. Right. Does that answer your question, Omar? Yeah, but um, is there any uh special thing about the deformation quantization compared to other uh it's uh, for mathematically inclined uh what you call mathematically inclined uh, researcher okay they would uh, prefer uh this uh, deformation quantization for some reason but uh, those who with physically inclined uh, kind of thinking uh, usually not because uh, you lose physical sense. See, the correspondence between the observables is not really obvious why you have a particular operator ordering. And then the other uh, thing that sort of you know, a highlight of uh, deformation quantization is conservation. Uh, work where what it says is that you can actually form a star product to every so you get this idea of star product okay that works for every Poisson, Poisson manifold okay a Poisson manifold is a manifold with uh, your Poisson bracket uh, structure on it okay so and for this work it's actually not it's not trivial, okay? And uh, this will actually one conservation uh, field matter. Okay. So uh, again, uh, I don't see this to be resolving the, the ground wall van Hoff uh, problem, okay? Now, uh, there was another question uh, Posted to me by, by the chairman of the, the conference. Uh, why do I prefer the, the uh, say, the Hilbert space? Remember that this deformation quantization is based on phase space. Okay? Uh, normally, they call it under the generic name of phase space quantization. Okay? 
Remember that uh, your Hilbert space quantization involves cutting half of these field space variables. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute for when you do the geometric quantization. So there, there are a few questions. When, when I try to compare between the two, there are uh, three different things that I wanted to see. First, or maybe I go to the whiteboard now. See, uh, trying to compare quantizations, for example. So I look from three three different aspects. First, the observable quantization, the observable uh, point of view, where you have Ron Wolf and Hof. Okay. Next, it's really something that, that, again, people forget about it after a while, is the idea of the superposition principle. In the old days, we talked about wave particle duality. Okay? Uh, this is, obviously, this works when you have a Hilbert space. Because your Hilbert space essentially is a, a, a linear space. Okay, so this okay, these are the level of observable. These are the level of states. So a Hilbert space, a, a state, which is given uh, by a, a vector in a, in a Hilbert space, allows the superposition principle to work. And then uh, the final thing is probably uh, a thing that I, what a quantization no uh, ideally okay uh, ideally how can one uh, what's the word for it uh, by how can one bypass uh the classical stage of quantization because now what happens usually when you do quantization you always assume there's a, a classical uh, formulation first and then you you transfer it to the case of quant, uh, the quantum one okay so i always look in terms of this this tree okay so uh, for me, uh, one of the things, uh, again, uh, it's difficult to bypass this classical stage because uh, uh, there's, uh, no, there's problem when you, when you do that, you don't really have a full quantum language uh, that, used, that are used, being used to, to describe experiments. Okay, you always use uh, your your the experimental results that you get. It's always phrased in terms of something which is uh, done in a classical language. So this is where perhaps some input from uh, the the new progress in terms of quantum information. Okay, so you talk about uh, things like POVM and things like that. So these are things that I always look through, and also oh, uh, because of this also, uh, that's actually an, another aspect is the idea of uh, state observable duality. Which is again, uh, uh, comes from quantum information that you can always see these things happening. And from the state observable duality, you can actually uh, uh, form uh, things like, you know, you can start to talk about mixed states. Okay. And already there, you know that uh, how to describe mixed states are already your know, density operators.
Okay, so okay, I'm running out of time now. Uh, so let me go back to the slides. Okay, so what do you do uh, for the case of the geometric quantization? Is simply this: you assume a symplectic manifold, and you assume that you can do this. And in fact, you can. The only problem is that uh, it doesn't quite. Uh, correspond to uh, you have Schrodinger quantization but what you have is a uh, you get many copies of that you get a reducible representation okay so in other words uh, this is not quite nice because you have to look at you know, uh, uh, if it's if it's an irreducible then you can start from a, a, a small set going to a bigger set but in this particular case you you don't really have that okay so what happens is that okay on on the, why is this possible in the case of a uh, symplectic manifold you can always define vector fields on s and vector fields on s are already operators the qi and then the DPI, and if you want, you can add some connection term here. Okay, this would represent your momenta, and this would represent your your cues. So there are already an operator version available on your symplectic manifold. This is what we call the pre-quantization level. So you talk about all these vector fields coming in, okay? Uh, right. So, so this is where I mentioned just now. So your your general general what I call functions now will be replaced by vector fields in this manner. Uh, in this one, I uh, don't have any connections over here, but never mind. So, but the idea is you can get all your Poisson bracket algebra written in terms of operators acting on you know, something. Okay, so one could actually use this pre-quantization map to define the operators, so to speak. Okay, but note that the operators involve both DDQI and both DDPI which you know that you, uh, for the case of Schrodinger representation, you do not really want that. Okay, you need to cut uh, half of that uh, what you call variables. So uh, cutting and down uh, half of the variables is known uh, to be uh, is known as polarization and geometric polarization. Okay. So the idea is uh, you can always find uh, some domain where uh, you, know, you construct a bundle over, over the phase space. I mean, uh, never mind what it is. Okay? But the idea is you can always find uh, a section of the bundle in such a way that it obeys uh, this kind of uh, what you call uh, condition. Okay? Uh, roughly speaking, what it does is like, okay, I have this uh, configuration space down here. Okay. At the level of the configuration space, okay, I only need to have your DDX or DDQ. Whichever, okay. uh, if I take DDP, on this level of the configuration space, then this will actually give you zero. So that's the basic idea of the, the, this, this uh, condition. Okay. The only thing uh, is that, okay, uh, you assume a symplectic manifold, but there are cases where you have symplectic manifold not to be polarizable. So that's one problem. Okay. And this actually uh, uh, shown by Gauté and of, of course several other mathematicians. Okay. 
And uh, what do you do once you have uh, found that sort of polarization? Then you start to talk about uh, you know, operators are acting on this domain D, which belongs to you know, your your operators act on this particular domain, and then uh, this uh, domain will have a inner product structure. Again, this is not automatic. One needs to make sure what this uh, mu is, the measure. Okay, so you need to, to do all this, and then uh, once you do all this, and then make sure that all this quantization uh, of the observables behave uh, accordingly uh, with the, the algebraic structure. And uh, the condition that one needs in this particular case is given by uh, your your curvature of this gradient operator, okay, which involves uh, some connection in terms of fiber bundle theory, is equals to the symplectic form. So this is uh, known quite early on. I think probably. Uh, Costan was the first one. Costan and zero. Okay, uh, I think I'll better wrap things up a little bit. Okay, so the second crossroad is the following. So why do I prefer uh, canonical group quantization? At least, you no, know, uh, to the point of what I've done. Okay is the fact that uh, I would bypass the need for polarization by just considering a special class of manifolds, which is the cotangent bundle. So the, the idea of polarization, as I said, is to, to make sure that you have uh, half of your uh, variables sort of uh, goes away. So in other words, uh, in the con context of uh, wave functions over the uh, configuration space okay so you will only have operators acting on on your configuration space in that sense and this is uh, from a physical point of view you no know, when you do uh, uh, particles on, on a particular surface or whatever or a particular manifold your manifold is your Q your phase space will be your cotangent bundle. Okay. Your Q manifold and your cotangent bundle will give you the phase space. So there is an automatic division between your, your coordinates on your manifold with the coordinates on your phase space which involves the fiber coordinates. Okay. So you already have that. Uh, so why why no? Some people will say that okay, you should have the most general thing, but you already know that quantization w doesn't work generally. Okay, you always need to look at the context of you know, what what variables are there and things like that. So why uh, why burden yourself with general general generalities when you don't really have that. Uh, the same view is uh, with respect to things. Uh, if you remember, uh, Ahmad uh, bias work with uh, complex manifold. It takes a particular uh, polarization there. I think uh, holomorphic polarization, rather than thinking of what's the most general thing. Okay. So again, over there, you'll find that, okay, you, you don't really need all these generalities. You want something that works physically. So that's essentially uh, the, you know, the point of view that I have. And the other one was essentially the idea of canonical group. Now, if you remember, the canonical group is essentially the one that keeps your symplectic form invariant. And why this is important? Because your symplectic form gives you uh, your Poisson bracket. Okay. 
and your Poisson bracket essentially gives you the equation of motion. So when, when you compare between the two different quantization schools, uh, one says, okay, uh, you select uh, your observers accordingly so that you, know, you have a particular group sort of, uh, that preserve this uh, symplectic form. Okay? And uh, in other words, when you preserve the symplectic form, you preserve the equation of motion. Okay? Compare this with the deformation quantization school that sort of say that, okay, what we quantize, we will be quantizing something which is only approximately true for the equation of motion. So that is another, again, this is just my point, a personal point of view, saying that, no, you, you would prefer something at Z to be quantized. In this particular case, the physical content is coming from equation of motion. So that was the reason why you know, the, the, the idea of canonical group quantization seems to be you know, uh, attractive to me. See? And the other thing about this, once you find a canonical group uh, for the uh, quantization, the canonical group already uh, uh, sort of obeys the geometric uh, character of the, 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 the underlying space. Okay. And uh, the other thing about it, uh, you can also forget, if you want, you can forget the underlying space and just focus on the canonical group quantization. And this is actually done by you know, uh, people who are doing all this you know, you know, Kirillov's uh, orbit method and things like that. So they forget totally what's, you know, what's the starting point. Here we still now consider what what's the starting point. Are you guys still there? Because everyone seems quiet. Sometimes I have to. Check. Yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> because sometimes what happens is that uh, my network fails, and I'm just uh, uh, talking. A Okay, uh, so that was uh, the idea. The other part of the talk that I'm supposed to say more is, okay, I'm going to skip all this. I think you have seen this before. And this some of you. Okay. Is to uh, connect this with uh, non-competitive quantum mechanics, which, uh, uh, no, Fauzi uh, tends to work on this. The only problem that one has in this particular case is the fact that uh, really, if you want to impose this, uh, you should ask what would be the space that actually uh, obeys this classically. So that was actually a quite uh, 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 something which is so you no, know, uh, one can just simply bypass the you no know, the, the idea, uh, you no, know, and then just think of. Okay, uh, one of the possibilities is just to think of your symplectic form. Uh, you have the, the 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 standard one, and then you just add. Uh, in this case, uh, theta dq. Let me just write this properly. Theta i j dq i dq j plus uh, usually it's done in terms of uh, i j d p i d p j. Okay, so uh, here you know, for example, this will depend on your q's, but then over here it will depend on your p's. So what precisely is this thing? So uh, that no, even if you understand this okay, in this way, you still have to understand what this uh, theta is supposed to represent. Uh, and uh, I'm still stuck with this. Uh, one of the possibilities is to look at some uh, 
uh, I have mentioned this to Fauzi before, is operator value uh, kind of uh, operator value uh, observable kind of thing. You know? Just like when you do for the case of the phase space on the uh, on the symplectic manifold, you can have uh, your vector fields to be you know operator value in that sense. So uh, one one is to start with with how to do this properly. Okay? Besides just you no know, assuming this thing, and uh, one of the the other things that 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 sort of bothers me a bit because there seems to be connection between these two okay and i could not really uh, understand this properly so that was my hope initially when i wrote down this uh, topic for the uh, the conference i thought i would be able to do something on this uh, stuff but no i just have to leave that at some other point in the future i suppose but that was the uh, essentially uh, my talk okay. so this is for this work and uh, what's nice about the the no how this work talks about bob shift bob shift where your uh your position operator gets uh no uh uh momentum operator kind of thing added together okay and again no what what's the understanding of this uh it does seem to re, uh, have some reminiscence uh, with hardin's work hardin's work also assume this kind of operators okay and uh, the idea here is essentially okay what happens is that okay you have your phase space but you cannot really point out each point on the phase space, or in this case, uh, your non-commutative space. Okay, uh, so this is not your phase space, probably just your configuration space. But you cannot really uh, resolve this because the problem is you have your your QI QJ is now no longer commute. And the reason in, in the case of Haldane was that, okay, your points on your face space is not really a good observable, but what happens, you have this, uh, oh, sorry, uh, your points on, on your, yeah, your points on your face space is not really a good observable. So if you would try to trace the, the cyclotron orbit, for example, you really need to go through all these points but what is a good observable is the uh, the center of the cyclotron orbit. Okay, and that is the one that's given in terms of uh, of uh, Haldane's work in terms of the capital R i. So uh, I was trying to think of whether one can actually do this uh, properly for the non-commutative, uh, say, non-commutative plane. Uh, but no. Uh, I just don't have the time to do it uh, in some sense, but also there's some puzzling uh, uh, concepts involved. Okay, so uh, going to this non-commutative quantum mechanics has been approached to various different quantization techniques. So uh, the one by Prof. Tari and uh, Dr. Hassan, Sy Sy Hassan, using coherent states quantization, and again. Uh, it involves the idea of gauge, okay, meaning there is a connection uh, involved, and and how precisely is this uh, uh, connection is actually uh, built was not really uh, at least from my point of view it's not really understood. Okay, so when uh, site came to Inspam, uh, we sort of sat down. And then some of the earlier gauges that they talked about was not really general enough. So we talked about those and then we talked about how to formulate this 
using Wigner function. And remember, Wigner functions are not really uh, a proper quantization because it's actually just functions on your face space. Okay. So again, the, 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 the problem of, of doing quantization on non-commutative uh, space is still, to me at least, for me is still an open problem. So I think that's all that I want to say. It's already gone past one. Okay. So I acknowledge uh Sai San Chaudhry, Fauzi and Dr. Nuresha. Okay. Right, that's it. Questions if there are any. Are you still there? <laughs> okay. Is Pauzi here? Pauzi is also not. Okay. And so can your 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 kid. <laughs> Uh, regarding the relationship between quantization and conformation, I'm still quite not clear how, how to relate it because well, uh, I don't know, normally people in quantum formation they already assume the quantum system, right? Eh? In quantization, it's quantum yeah, system. it's not to say that uh, it's the idea, some of this idea, but uh, an example would be the the uh the state channel duality kind of thing. Okay. So these are things uh, which I thought that, okay, one should be able to incorporate some of these ideas uh, within the context of quantization. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, quantum information uh, always assume that quantum mechanics is at work. Okay. But there are things like, no, things like they talk about POVMs, no, which was not really known earlier, no, and that has now become a, a part of uh, part of the language uh, in some quantization school, like like coherent state quantization, for example. Okay. See, uh, uh, one of the things that we have been avoiding is the functional analytic part. You don't talk about what me what measures are available on this on the, the Hilbert space and things like that. Is that it? Uh, let me read that properly. I didn't get the first time. Uh, why the Lie algebra is considered in the quantization instead of the Lie group? Because uh, essentially, no, uh, the, the Lie algebra is actually uh, seen locally. Okay. Uh, your group structure, yes, you have the group structure when you think of it in the, in the global sense. So that's why uh, uh, the relationship between Lie groups and Lie algebras are there, okay? But the, at the local level, you only see the algebras. I hope that answers a little bit. So that's why in the, in the context of this canonical quantization, you just focus on your commutators which are uh, coming from Lie algebras but when you do uh, things involving uh, geometric ideas you have to see what what groups are that respect the symmetries of the underlying space so that's why in the case of Chris Isham's uh, quantization uh, technique it talks about canonical group thank you prof just I have one quick how we can do the quantization for speed of the particle? Okay, that, that's a good question. 
spin doesn't exist classically, right? But uh, what happens, uh, one can have something like, you know, when you take subspaces, you can have, okay, first of all, uh, anything of angular momentous type kind of uh, quantization involve uh, finite dimensional Hilbert space. And finite dimensional Hilbert space can only come from a compact space. Let me go to the whiteboard. Uh, one of the things that I do a uh, long time ago when, when I first you know, started my research in UPM is to consider, uh, come on, go up please. Why is it not going up? One, uh, I'll just clear this thing up. Clear. See, uh, on your finite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, comes from angular momenta. Right? This includes uh, the case of spin. Okay? Uh, so how can you actually think uh, uh, classically uh, this idea of spin is in the context of let's consider the case of your configuration space, your Q to be say R3 minus a single point. Okay. So really your uh, your your space in this particular case is something like this. So you have this origin here for example. So you you puncture the space and this gives you something uh, the, the topology of this is roughly S2 Close up. So uh, if you take this kind of you no know, the, the topological nature of this uh, space, okay, you will uh, no it, your particle sort of goes around in this space in R three, but it can never approach this point. Okay, that space will have this topology, and that topology will have this part which is a compact space. And that compact space, if you think of it as a, a, as a phase space, that will give rise you to the, uh, the angular momentum algebra. And remember, angular momentum algebra uh, is only uh, local. So in the context of a, a quantum version of it, uh, your SU2 algebra is just like, okay, maybe I should write L of that, it's just uh, uh, isomorphic to the case of SO3 algebra. So or in other words, SU2 is a double covering of SO3. So in that case, you can get spin by considering uh, a phase space which is uh, based on this uh, configuration space which is uh, remove uh, one particular point. Okay. If, uh, again, this is not, uh, I should say that this is just a toy model thing. So then you'll be able to con consider uh, your your two sphere as a part of the compact case. Okay, there you will see that uh, that was this uh, thesis by Low Pit Way. I don't know where my copy has gone to, uh, but you can actually get uh, uh, the the SO three algebra, and hence when you do double cover, you get yeah, SU two. You don't get spin 
directly from the classical case, but you go to the double covering of your SO3. Does that answer your question? Okay. Even even in the case when you know uh, the Wigner classification of particles, for example. So when they try to uh, classify uh, uh, those particles under Poincaré group, okay, then you'll find that what you need is essentially uh, because of the, the, the thing that was uh, considered is a projective representation of the Poincaré group. So when you do uh, the, the, the group itself, you can go to the double cover for example. So you get uh, SO3 being replaced by SU2. Sorry if my question is off-putting. What is the problem with quantization of gravity? Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, the problem with uh, quantization of gravity is you really want to quantize your metric tensor. Okay. And uh, that's, uh, okay, maybe I go back to the whiteboard. So, let's clear this thing up. So, uh, so uh, really what you need is to, to quantize G mu nu. Okay. Of course, uh, nobody has done that. Okay. Uh, when they try to do it, but no, you get uh, a non-renormalizable theory just because of you no know, uh, the fact that this has dimensional couplings and things like that. So you get you know, terms that 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 doesn't quite work. Uh, Chris Isham itself actually go uh, simplify this a little bit uh, goes to the point of replacing your space time by just looking at the three-dimensional metric GIG okay, so this is three dimension and see the space of this matrix what would be the canonical group acting on this uh, space of uh, three matrix and remember the space of three matrix space of three matrix is infinite dimensional it's no longer uh, finite dimensional so that's why when you do this kind of thing you will have uh, infinite dimensional groups in uh, in my PhD work, I did attempt try to put strings on the torus. Now, strings can be think, thought of as uh, the maps of S1 onto Tn. And whatever the map is, for example, say psi, so the configuration, of, configuration space of this would be uh, the space of these maps. Okay. And the space of these maps are normally uh, given in terms of uh, loop spaces. Okay. And loop spaces will have loop groups, for example. Again, these are things that was a little bit beyond my effort at that time to, to look into this. Okay. So uh, anything involving field theory will involve infinite dimensional groups. So that's why uh, when it comes to uh, doing uh, quantum field theory, you, you do it differently. Okay. You don't go through this uh, quantization kind of thing. Instead, of they, they, they talk about second quantization. Okay, you quant you do the first quantization first, and then after that you do the second quantization. Does that tell you uh, answers 
your question. Uh, I'm not sure about the fine thing. The fine thing is coming from from the fact that your matrix is always uh, for the three dimensional matrix. Your fine thing is coming from the matrix being always positive. Okay, you don't have that opposite uh, signature of the time. So because of that, you want to let's say if I do a transformation from one metric to another metric, so that uh, you remember the symmetry transformation, uh, turning from one metric to another metric, you must obey the positivity preserving thing. So that's uh, why you have the idea of a, a fine group coming in. Any other questions besides that? We have gone 20 minutes past, so I think I should stop. Can I ask one question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, for people to study, I mean, I think this is a repeating question. Entanglement from quantization perspective. <laughs> well, uh, that because, was your uh, I, found, I found a paper, uh, I think, in the result in mathematical physics. They use scalar quantization and entanglement. Okay, I do not know what that is, but uh, uh, the the initial problem that I, I posed to you was that, right? So, but but the idea is perhaps a bit a bit more subtle than that, I think, because uh, when you talk about quantization, there uh, you involving subspaces, you no. Know, uh, so these are things that you no know, probably is not really. Uh, no, I can't really put this in a in a in a kind of a systematic procedure. So you really have to let's suppose you have a space of two qubits, for example, or oh, no, the classical version of it. Uh, somehow, uh, when you quantize, for example, you will need a, a bigger group because let's say you have s u two for each qubit then you need, uh, essentially, you need uh, SU4 as your canonical group on whatever spaces of two qubits supposed to be, okay? So, but again, uh, how, how precisely this can be formulated is the thing that sort of still puzzles me, okay? Because, uh, if I take just simply CP1 cross CP1, I don't think we will get anywhere. Okay, uh, we'll need some some bigger spaces than that. So that was the thing that I posed to you that maybe you can think in terms of a fiber bundle over these two spaces. Um, but again, it's not easy as as easy as no what I've said. But uh. The, the least that one can do is now to consider your CPN as as your classical phase space. Because you already have a symplectic structure there. Okay. The, the breakdown of that, how to get the entanglement is, of course, uh, No, uh, no, in that particular case, uh, uh, if you frame your CPN as your classical phase space, right, your, those entangled states, whichever, you no, know, whatever form of entanglement, will be subspaces of the, the CPN. So there, no, uh, how can you actually do it? Uh, no, how can you actually address entanglement from the point of view of quantization is not very clear, but certainly uh, the idea is, okay, if, if you have local symmetries, then you can talk about, uh, see, you have your CPN, but you also have local symmetries. Okay. So there you're supposed to be able to say something about entanglement. Your local symmetries are coming from the, your local, if it's qubits, it's local as you do. And people have actually studied those. So you take your CPN, 
uh, reduce it by this uh, what you call uh, so-called SG2 action and to see you know, uh, the kind of spaces that you have left. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, Said Mullah Dawoodi was actually trying to do, but of course you know, we didn't get to that and uh, we only actually uh, caution it with the case of the uh, torus, the U1s rather than the SU2s. Okay, uh, any more last question before we stop? Or discussion? Who is present anyway? So I think I better stop. Uh, I hope uh, no, you learned something. Or I'm not sure, but uh, so can we call it a day? Okay, thank you, everyone.